Hi, you're listening to Redneck Theology, a short program providing a common sense look at Christianity. I'm your host, Bill Witte. Questions or comments may be emailed to redneckTheology at gmail.com. Now, on with the broadcast. Christians, be quiet. If you consider yourself a Christian, listen closely. Now, by all means, if you're unsure or uncertain that you're not a Christian, you're invited to continue to listen. I just want to point out up front, this podcast is directed more toward the Christians in the audience than anyone else. Perhaps no one today is actually in plain language saying, Christians, be quiet. I haven't heard even the radical Islamic leaders come right out and demand our silence. Now, true, many laws are aimed at quieting the preaching of the gospel. Underground churches exist in many places because Christians cannot meet in public. People are warned of harsh punishments for teaching the Bible. In essence, Christians are told not to speak. The order to be quiet may be clearly meant, but it isn't clearly stated in no uncertain terms. Do you wonder why so many oppose Christianity across the globe and many persecute Christians telling them to convert, yet nobody openly says for Christians to be quiet? Well, now that I've asked the question, uh, some, no doubt, will simply attribute it to an unconscious fear of God. And perhaps God simply prevents such a decree from coming forth. Could be they know Jesus' statement in the 19th chapter of Luke, where he told the Pharisees that if the people were to be silent, the rocks would cry out and praise to God. So maybe the leaders of anti-Christian groups fear that such a statement would work in reverse, causing Christians to speak out even more. Certainly in places like the United States, if someone made such a statement, the outcry would be loud and long. After all, we have religious freedom. We Christians, at least in the United States, relied on the promise of religious freedom so blindly we didn't see when it was taken away. What? Taken away? What are you talking about? See, Jesus chose animals well when he compared his followers to sheep. The sheep truly need a shepherd. They can't be contained in a corral for long because they'll eat the pasture down so far that they'll kill it. They'll destroy their own source of food. The shepherd must keep them moving to fresh grazing. Really, they're not too smart. I've heard it said that sheep are the only animal that could get lost in their own backyard with a map, compass, and a gate closed. Well, like good sheep, we allowed ourselves to be herded into a nice green pasture where we can graze in relative comfort and grow in numbers as long as we don't disturb anyone else. See, we lost our religious freedom without even realizing it. And no doubt some of you think right now I've gone over the edge making such a statement. You'll point out all the different beliefs we're free to practice. Oh yes, we're free to practice Christianity, just as long as we don't get loud. In other words, we can practice Christianity as long as we don't offend any of the non-Christians. We've been told to be quiet. Pastors, evangelists, and other popular so-called Christian speakers urge us to exhibit tolerance. They call upon us to live as Jesus did and let others see his love in us the way that, that that's the way to promote the gospel. Well, no doubt a lot of you are shaking your heads right now saying, that's right, that's right, that's the way we ought to do it. The Jesus of the Bible is the same Jesus who called upon the religious leaders of the time and told them to repent, calling them whited sepulchers. That's in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and verse 27, if you care to read it. He called the religious leaders hypocrites more than once. If we are to truly live as Jesus lived and show the world by our actions, we must be revolutionaries. Jesus didn't walk in towns and simply proclaim love and peace. He warned of judgment to come. He used object lessons and parables to illustrate the choice to make between heaven and hell. He overturned the tables of money changers and other thieves in the temple. He called sin what it is, 
and he offered forgiveness and love to the sinner that would repent. Jesus never apologized for offending anyone, and he offended plenty. He didn't make it his aim or purpose to offend. He spoke the truth. If it cut to the heart of anyone, he offered a solution to heal the wound, not an apology for making it. Whoa now, Brother Bill, you're getting rather extreme here. Yes. One of the goals of this podcast is to present Christianity in a common sense way. Well, it's clear common sense if you're going to follow Jesus and try to be like him, you need to speak out like he did. You need to call sin, sin, and show those committing it forgiveness is available. Am I sounding radical? I hope so. Jesus was a radical. Some of us go to foreign countries and we we go out with pastors there to proclaim the gospel. And we come back to our local church and we're deemed missionaries. In fact, we went to a foreign country and assisted a local church to do what we won't do at home. Many of the missionary trips go to help people for a week or two. And after we leave, another group comes in. And after they leave, another group. That local work may receive assistance from many groups. No wonder people come back so from the, the so-called mission trips, telling just how wonderfully God's moving. Groups are going out spreading the, the teachings of the gospel repeatedly from the local church. Or people come home having seen what can happen when the word of God is repeatedly shared with people. And we'll get excited about helping by gathering supplies and money to send to, to help that work go on. And what do we do at home? We, we have a vacation Bible school. And we invite people to come. Maybe let's have special singings for folks to attend. We can put on suppers you know, for those in need or, or just gather together. A group might, might have a regular Bible study. We, we might even pass out a few flyers or post a note to a local gas station. What's wrong with this? Nothing. Almost everything we do, though, requires people to come to us. We make invitations. We need to go to them. A new idea might generate some excitement. A few invitations may be made as a result. We can't and shouldn't try to force people to take part, and we know that. Most of our neighbors, well, they they probably go to church anyway. We might not have talked to a lot of them, but, you know, they seem like good people. In the end, a few people invite a few people as a matter of kind of a responsibility. Well, you know, I go there. We need to support the outreaches of our church. Where's the excitement of going into the neighborhood or the outlying region with the gospel message and an invitation? If we went out in America and proclaimed God's word like we did when we went on so-called mission trips, we'd see God manifest himself like we see and hear about in foreign countries. Instead, we have listened to the quiet command from the enemy saying, Christians, be quiet. I've been as guilty as the next. I've been far too quiet too long. Christians, it's time to repent of our socially acceptable churchiness and get radical. Jesus said in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And you might say, well, I'm not denying. Anybody ask me, I'll tell them I'm a Christian. I I don't deny God. Refusal to go out and speak is a form of denial. Refusal to promote the gospel is a form of denial. Many people who call themselves Christians, they say they don't even know how to lead a person to Christ. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, after pointing out sin, simply offer to pray with a person that wants to become a Christian, having them repeat after you if they don't know what to say. As long as they mean the words, it's okay to repeat. The essentials to include in a prayer are to admit being a sinner, stating belief in Jesus' death and resurrection as payment for their sins, 
asking forgiveness, and dedicating their life to God from there on. It doesn't have to be a long prayer with lots of pretty flowery language. It just needs to be from the heart and expressed with the mouth. Now, if you've listened this far and you're not sure you're a Christian or you know you need God's forgiveness, you can pray with me right now and repeat this prayer out loud from your heart. So, Dear God, I admit I have sinned. I am a sinner. I am asking you to forgive all my sins. I want Jesus to be in charge of my life from now on. With your help, I will turn away from sin and live according to your word, the Bible. Thank you, God, for hearing me and saving me just now. Amen. Now, if you are a Christian and don't go about looking for ways to tell people about Jesus, then admit to God you've grown cold and ask his forgiveness. Whether you just became a Christian or have been one, it's important to pray. Talk to God daily and take time to listen to. Praying is not just talking to him. For the new Christian, I suggest starting to read the Word of God with the book of, of John and read daily, first asking God to speak to you through His Word and help you understand it. Worship with fellow Christians. Share your excitement. Go to Sunday school. Go to Bible studies. Tell everyone you can about becoming or being a Christian. Find others to work together with organizing ways and, and times to go out to the region, just as if you were in a mission field. In fact, you are in a mission. America may be one of the hardest mission fields and one of the greatest. Why hardest? Because so many people think they are already Christians. Many of them will say to the radical, excited, real Christians, be quiet. That's our program for today. I'm Bill Witte, thanking you for listening to Redneck Theology. Your questions or comments may be emailed to redneckthology at gmail.com. Please join me again next time for more Redneck Theology.